dominant defense. That's what we expected all offseason from Texas A&M, and that's what we got in a big game against Auburn as they held uh, Bo Nix and company to a field goal. One field goal, first drive of the game, and then that's it. And they not only did that, they created the offense as well with a scoop and score for a touchdown, and they defeated Auburn 20-3. to uh, What I thought was going to be a great game didn't turn out to be uh, so much of one as uh, the Aggies rolled in this one um, after the halftime score of 3-3. Three to three. We got Andrew Hattersley on the line from Gigum 247 to break it down for us. Hey, Andrew. Hey, Mark, how you doing? Yeah, you, you, you said it pretty well there. I mean, the defense and just what they were able to do. I, I think when we, when we talked last week, they pretty much did everything we kind of talked about, about containing Bo Nix and limiting those big plays. And, you know, I think he only had one pass of over 15 yards. And just a, just a clinic that they put on defensively on all, on all fronts. That was probably the biggest matchup, um, not just in the conference, but nationally on Saturday. So a lot of people were watching. A lot of people got familiar also with uh, Tyree Johnson. He can play. Boy, Kenny Everett. And I mean, just what he's been able to do, he's really come into his own the past few weeks. When you look at, um, he was a little bit limited this past week because he was coming off that injury against South Carolina. But if you go and look at what he's done the past four or five games, it's been just remarkable. Um, You know, two sacks again, just as what he's been able to do off the edge has just freed so much – has freed the A&M defense up so much to go make plays, and um, he's, he's just been tremendous. For anybody who's into stats, you know that uh, yards per attempt for a quarterback is a key stat in regards to keeping explosiveness and efficiency down. If you're a defense, 3.7 yards per pass for Bo Nix, threw it 41 times, could only muster 153 yards – in the air. So that's, uh, that speaks to the dominance as well. Tank Bigsby, we talked about him last week, held him in check. His longest run was 11 yards on 15 carries. His average was decent, but certainly didn't do damage. Well, I think the thing that, you know, and it goes back to what we talked about last week was we were going to find out just how much this, just in terms of discipline and paying attention to details. Cause those are the things when you look, when, when it, when NM played Arkansas, and the first half against Arkansas, uh, when they were in just complete disarray, Jimbo Fisher talked a lot about how they got out of their pass rush lanes. They got out of, you know, their discipline and, and were over pursuing on things. You didn't see that on, on Saturday. And um, if you let Bo Nix get out of the pocket, that's when he makes his, his big plays. But if you just force him to make plays from the pocket, um, he's a little bit in some ways – like Zach Calzada, where his feet kind of gets inconsistent, struggles with accuracy, starts to make mistakes. And so the fact that A&M was able to do that limited the big plays and um, defensive, the defensive backs did a great job. There wasn't a whole lot of separation when you talk about receivers and they were able to get home and generate pressure and, and, and kind of mix up defense. Auburn couldn't get the running game going either. And so, uh, just on all fronts, really showed how much this team has grown in just a month. Join us on Patreon, our voice of college football community over there. I pick all the top 25 games. Then we got 20 media members, including this guy. Andrew's there with us as well. Uh, Picks a 12-pack of games each and every week. I pick all the top 25 games, which is typically about 20, 25 games, 13 and eight against the spread last week, 120 and 77 for the years, well over 60%. So join us there on Patreon. Yeah, the defense uh, carried it. Obviously, there was not a touchdown scored in the game by either team on offense, four field goals. And, um, you know, Jimbo Fisher, he wants explosive plays. He wants, uh, the quarterback to play well. He's obviously a stickler for quarterback play, really rides his quarterbacks. All of that we know about Jimbo Fisher, but he also is a smart coach that knows this is the way the game is. This is the way this particular, this game is playing out. And my defense is not losing this game. So I'm going to run the ball. And he got uh, basically a hundred yards out of both Isaiah Spiller and Devin Achain. And uh, so they ran, ran with the running game as well. Yeah, I think they've, um, and I talked about this a little bit on Saturday night too, was they've kind of found their formula that's worked now. 
Um, you know, it started in that, you know, a little bit that Missouri game where they were able to go to the running game, um, continued it against South Carolina and continued it this week that uh, they're kind of getting into that ball control, control the game, control the pace of the game, not turn the ball over. Um, Zach Calzada didn't turn the ball over this game, which was big. Uh, Devon Achain did have that fumble, but you get close to 200 yards on the ground from Isaiah Spiller and Devon Ache, and you, those are your two b- biggest weapons offensively. And then uh, I think this offense has really benefited from getting Caleb Chapman back as a guy that can kind of get over the top of the defense, sure-handed, uh, can make plays in that regard. And so um, I think they're really excited to have him back and just what he's brought to the offense. But you're right. I mean, it's not going to ever look pretty. But I don't think Jimbo Fisher really cares when it comes to style points as long as you're winning the games. And um, A&M the past two years now is, is uh, I believe they're 17 and three or 16 and three the past two years. And so he's found a formula that's worked. Um, and you're right. He's been very hard on Zach Calzada, but we've seen how much he's improved over the past four weeks and just, and just what, what strides he's made. Uh, yeah. It's just a really, really, good all around coaching job. And it you can kind of notice it when you talk to various people around, around football, around the state of Texas, just what a job he's done. Andrew Hattersley joining us from Gigum 247 sports, Texas A&M now seven and two after besting Auburn 20 to three. They've got a tough one against Ole Miss on the road in Oxford coming up. Join uh, Andrew and his work on Gigum 247 sports and lock it in. Of course, here at the voice of college football, give us a like subscribe to the channel do all those good things to keep it uh, locked in here. Trip to Oxford. So Ole Miss, obviously, this is going to be a game in which people are eyeing the Texas A&M defense, which is rock solid. Got to be a top five unit in the country. I don't care what the stats say, just in terms of talent, execution, all of it. It's a top five to ten unit in the country, and we know that Lane Kiffin can scheme and match up as well as anybody on the offensive side of the ball, and he's got one of the very best in Matt Corral. He's a bit nicked up. He wasn't able to run the football against Liberty the way they typically run Matt Corral. He stayed in the pocket but still delivered for 324 yards. So it's it's going to be quite the X's and O's and talent matchup between Texas A&M's defense and Ole Miss's offense. Yeah, to your point, the numbers actually back you up too. I mean, A&M's up to number two in, the, in terms of scoring defense in the country. Uh, behind Georgia, which has just been on another level this season defensively. You're right; it's going to be a it's going to be an intriguing matchup, and really interested to see because this game wasn't played last year with COVID and all that happened. This was the game that um, was canceled on on one side on the A and M side first, and then wasn't able to be rescheduled. And so, really interested to see how how A is able to slow down a Lane Kiffin offense. And I think they're going to need to score. They're going to need to be better offensively than they were last week. Um, but yeah, it's, it's going to be, it's going to come down to getting pressure. And, um, I think going on the road, this is, this is obviously the biggest test on the road that A&M's had so far, but I don't I see why I wouldn't be able to, to travel on the road with them and just to, with the way they've been playing, um, the formula that they have, um, it's going to be a really interesting test on, on how Saturday night goes. The SEC Western Division sizes up like this with a month to play. Alabama at five and one, Texas A&M at four and two, Auburn at three and two, Ole Miss at three and two. The intriguing part and the key in all this is that obviously Texas A&M has that win against Alabama head to head. Um, of course, Texas A&M is going to be out of it if they lose this one to Ole Miss. Uh, they can take care of the Rebels this week. Uh, they've already taken care of Auburn head to head, and then they're going to be. <laughs> rooting for the Auburn Tigers like nobody's business on the last weekend in November. So Auburn's got a puncher shot in that game. Uh, certainly Alabama's been susceptible. We saw that uh, this past Saturday against LSU, uh, a game that they held uh, LSU out of the end zone a few times when the Tigers had a shot late, but um, held on for a 20 to 14 win. So, you know, Aggie fans can dream a little bit. They can, and I mean, I my colleague Josh Pate brought up a good point this weekend that really A&M was one LSU drive away from realistically controlling their own destiny in terms in terms of the SEC championship game. Now, Alabama was able to hold on. Um, Auburn's going to need to play a lot better offensively 
when they when they host Alabama. But I, I think they can give Alabama some trouble defensively, especially with the problems that Alabama's had along the offensive line. I think that's going to be an interesting matchup. But for for A and M, yeah, this is kind of the one of the big hurdles left is to get past Ole Miss. And um, I think I think when you look at A and M though, they'll take in a heartbeat right now, regardless of how the next three weeks play out. If they if they're able to do what they need to do and finish ten and two, um, we'll take it in a heartbeat. Considering the way the SEC slate started with the loss to Arkansas and Mississippi State. Uh, to turn around in the fashion that they have gives them a lot of momentum. I think regardless of whether it's enough to get to Atlanta or not is remains to be seen. Um, but they've, they've certainly put themselves in a position to play for, to play some extremely meaningful games in November. And it starts this, this week. Um, LSU is going to be another challenging one when they go to death Valley in a couple weeks. Uh, but yeah, there's just some huge games on the road now. And we'll pay some respect to Sam Pittman and company. They do get their shot at uh, Alabama as well. And we've seen on occasion, most notably against Texas A&M, also against Texas. And they kind of righted the ship this past weekend against Mississippi State and getting a win that Arkansas Mm -hmm. is a pretty capable football team. Sure, they're going to be a huge underdog against Bama. But uh, between Auburn and Arkansas, two pretty good football teams that will have a shot at the tide and taking them down to clear the way for Texas A&M. And as we've seen kind of this during this college football season already, we've seen plenty of surprises come, come our way just at, at all, at all points. So, you know, it's, it's just one of those things you've got to play the game. And I think that was the message from Jimbo Fisher this week when he was asked, you know, you have a lot to play for. Do you even look at the standings and do you worry about what's going on around the rest of the SEC? And it said, it doesn't matter if we don't beat Ole Miss. So that's kind of the attitude that they're taking is if they don't beat Ole Miss and beat LSU, then it's not really going to matter what else happens. So, you know, you just got to kind of play the games and see where the chips fall at, at the end of the, at the end of the month. Andrews at Gigum 247 sports. He also hosts our Texas A&M post game coverage uh, each and every week that we have on our sec channel and elsewhere. So please join him after uh, Texas A&M and Ole Miss. Um, and Andrew certainly addressed the uh, the two top 100 commits that came in uh, on Saturday as well. Were those two that um, you had pretty much marked down as definitely Texas A&M commits, or do you think the recent surge helped out uh, the Aggies there? Well, I think on bo- on both fronts, they they both kind of went similar trajectory or different trajectories, um, beginning with Chris Marshall. Um, he's got an. He's actually um, good friends with Devon Achain, who's who went to Fort Ben Marshall as well, and actually played a, a kind of a key role in convincing him to even play college football to begin with, because he was a really good basketball player and still is a very good basketball player at Fort Ben Marshall. So I always kind of thought when I talked to people around Texas, always kind of thought that 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 relationship would play a key role down the line. Um, he went on an official visit to A and M and over the summer and really really enjoyed it. Um, came back for the South Carolina game. And I think A&M had really kind of reaffirmed their position after that game and, and just the environment at Kyle Field um, ended up kind of selling them. And, you know, they, they beat out some, some other pretty big big programs in USC. Alabama was in the mix, um, just to name a few. Um, so I, I think he was a guy that I'd kind of keep, been keeping my eye on going back to the going back to the spring, but it was, leave no doubt, it was a really important target for A&M because um, I think they still need to add a little bit of juice to that wide receiver room, and and I think he brings that athleticism-wise, size-wise, just what he's able to do. I, th- I think it's a tremendous addition to the class and a guy that, that could, could, could add a lot to that receiver room. As for Walter Nolan, I think the momentum had kind of been trending that way. Um he came on a visit in July to A&M's recruiting barbecue pool party, and um, that completely changed the direct of the race. A&M was able to put themselves in the mix. They weren't really in the mix before that, uh, but that pool party kind of changed um, changed where things were going there. He came back for the Alabama game on an official visit, and obviously that went – tremendously and and just what they were able to show there he came back again for the South Carolina game 
Um, and then he came back again this past weekend. And then I think that's when started to get a little bit of attention is, um, and you know, it wasn't, it wasn't something that was necessarily surprising when he came back for a third time. It, it was a matter of, you know, would this be the weekend that he, he ends up announcing his decision and it came together very quickly. Um, for those that haven't seen the video, it's on his Instagram of, of him kind of telling Jimbo Fisher at midfield about his decision. And, and that's, that's a heck of a way to, to get some news right before you play Auburn. But uh, just a tremendous job by the a and staff over the past couple of months to get themselves into that race, um, deliver on the couple visits this fall, and get him to keep coming back because he's from Powell, Tennessee, not or Powell High, just down the road from from Knox from from Knoxville in Tennessee. And um, Tennessee's not going to give up. There's no doubt about that. They're going to continue pushing over the next month and see if they can get him on campus and, and continue to try. But um, it's just a testament to the job by Terry Price, Elijah Robinson to to really change the momentum of that recruitment over the past couple of months. And I think some, some struggles by other programs helped there too. You know, at one point Florida was very much in the mix and um, they're having a ton of, a ton of problems right now to say the least with Dan Mullen and, and recruiting overall over there. So, um, you know, I think, I think A&M kind of took advantage of an opportunity and, and sold him on, on what he, on his fit in the defense and what he was able to do. We're only five to six weeks away from National Signing Day. Yeah. Uh, right now, looking at the 247 board, uh, Texas A&M has 16 hard commits, number three in the SEC, number six nationally. Do you think this class is pretty well solidified, or do you think that there's uh, quite a few key guys on the fence that uh, we have to wait on their decision? Uh, a and is probably going to have a pretty active month. Uh, they've still got some work to do on the, on both lines, on the defensive and offensive line, um, continuing to plug away at guys like Cam Dewberry and Kelvin Banks and Mark Nabu, who would be just, uh, huge ads on the offensive line. I think there's still more work to do there. NATO, um, Uma Zelo is another one from Allen up here. Um, and then on the defensive line, there's still, Quite a few big targets left on the board, and um, Shamar Stewart and Eni White and Amari Abor. I'm going to see him this week, so um, get the latest on him. Ohio State is another school that's very much in the mix there, and so there's there's still quite a bit of work to do. They're they've they've put themselves similar to what they've done with with Walter Nolan. It's happened a little bit quicker, but they've they've put themselves in the mix for another five star wide receiver, Evan Stewart who's come back two straight games now. He came back from the South – he came for the South Carolina game and it was there this past weekend. So um, A&M has put themselves in the mix to, to have, you know, uh, an extremely strong finish. Uh, I think the the addition of Walter Nolan gives them a chance at the number one class, uh, depending on how the next few months go. Um, but Jimbo Fisher's always been really good about closing out classes and, and kind of – knowing when to hit the gas pedal and, and, and close out strong. So um, I think A&M is going to be a program to watch over the next couple of months. Texas A&M Ole Miss should be a heck of a game, and you can catch uh, Andrew's uh, post game right here at the Voice of College Football. So please lock it in, uh, Voice of College Football on the SEC channel here for post game of Ole Miss and Texas A&M with Andrew. Catch all of his work at Gigum 247 Sports. And Andrew, we always appreciate you stopping down by and uh, breaking things down for us. Appreciate it, Mark. Thank you.